So on Wednesday, we started in talking about heat exchangers. And we, let's see, start at the beginning here. Um, so we introduced heat exchangers, different types of heat exchangers, and then um, said that we're going to talk about only the concentric tube analysis for the concentric tube heat exchangers for parallel flow and counterflow configurations. And then we talked about, uh, kind of revisited the total resistance concept. So for heat exchangers, you have convection, conduction through the wall, and then convection again into the outer fluid. So you have to consider kind of the total resistance of all of those three types of heat transfer that are going on there. And then we um, kind of started writing down some expressions for the, um, the total resistance. So the first thing I want to do is revisit the first drawing I put up there. So we're going to have to be really explicit about our notation in this. So the notation is really confusing. There are ones and twos used for different things, I's and O's used for different things. So I want to clarify that we need to kind of specifically call out the thickness of the tube wall in this first drawing. We will frequently neglect the thickness of the tube wall and just say, okay, we're going to assume it's infinitely thin and there's no conduction resistance there. In that case, we won't have to consider the thickness and it'll just be kind of one radius. But for now, until we make that simplification, let's go ahead and say we've got the inner fluid, the tube wall of a finite thickness, and then the outer fluid. And so for this setup, R1 is going to be the radius to the inner wall, and then R2, the radius to kind of the outer part of the inner tube wall. Okay, and so I modified this before I posted it online. And then we'll go through a couple other um, kind of simplifications of our total thermal resistance and what the notation is for those cases. Okay, I'll leave that up there for just a second longer. And so the inner fluid and the outer fluid can either be hot or cold. Um, and basically the equations that we're deriving apply for either situation. Okay, so we wrote out the uh, total thermal resistance here. So this was kind of where we stopped on Wednesday and we basically had included this fouling factor to say if there's fouling on either of the tube surfaces, so the inner part of the inner tube or the outer part of the inner tube, then you have to account for that as this kind of added resistance and this fouling factor, this RF double prime here. And then we said the fouling factor is often taken as a constant, so just a constant value that you can look up in a table but in reality, it usually varies as the fouling kind of increases over time. So if you go from a clean, new heat exchanger, and then a heat exchanger that's operating over the years, it tends to, the fouling tends to increase, and then um, the fouling factors will increase as well. So just know that the fouling factors are always going to be an approximation. Okay, so that's everything that we went through on Wednesday. Did you all have any questions so far? Okay, so we'll start off today and we'll talk about some common simplifications that we're going to run into with heat exchangers and how that reduces the expressions or kind of simplifies the expressions for the uh, total um, thermal resistance. Okay, so we added fouling in. We're gonna take it right back out and say a common simplification that the book will often make is that there's no fouling. 
And usually if you do have to account for it, it's um, the fouling factor would be given. So for that, our equation reduces back down to just convection, conduction, and then convection. And note, since we're considering the conduction through the wall, that's why we have to explicitly call out this R2 and R1 as the thickness of that inner tube wall. So that's the conduction through that inner tube. Okay, so no fouling. Got my uh, subscripts swapped here. So H1 and L. And then, like I said, we're often going to neglect um, the conduction resistance of the inner wall. So if you look at it kind of mathematically, that can come from one of two things. So you could either assume that the wall was infinitely thin, and if so, R1 and R2 would be equal. So this would just be R over R, and the natural log of one is zero. So that effectively goes to zero mathematically. Or you could say that your thermal conductivity was uh, infinite. So in that case, you would have kind of something going to infinity on the bottom, and that would also force that term to zero. So either of those two conditions um, would allow you to neglect the thermal resistance. And you can show that kind of mathematically just looking at the factor there. So for negligible conduction resistance, We've still got our fouling factors here, but note now I'm just writing R for the radius rather than designating it as the inner or outer radius as one or two. Because like I said, if you're assuming that the wall is infinitely thin, then you just have that the two uh, radius values equal each other. Okay, and probably the most um, common simplification that we'll make is a combination of both of these. So the total resistance reduces quite a bit in this case. So if you neglect fouling and conduction resistance both, then all you have left is just the convection resistance from the inner fluid and then from the outer fluid. And again, you just have the radius R. So this is a common assumption or a common simplification. And this is where the notation gets a little bit dicey. So the book <coughs> uses for this um, kind of setup, since you neglect the thickness of the wall, they typically will provide uh, the inner diameter and the outer diameter. And that's the inner diameter of the inner tube and then the outer diameter of the entire outer tube. So that doesn't correlate directly to the R1 and the R2 that we drew before because you're not including the thickness of the wall. So let's draw that. Um, kind of set up if you're assuming that the wall is of negligible thickness. <coughs> 
Got our tubes here. Center line. Outer fluid on both of these parts. And then inner fluid. So again, these are concentric pipes and we're just looking at a cutaway. So a uh, circular pipe here inside of a larger circular pipe. And then the key thing, the key designation here is that this pipe has no thickness. And then this is the inner diameter, d sub i, and this is the notation that the book uses. So we're going to stick with it, even though i and o also mean inlet and outlet. And we'll see later, 1 and 2 are also used for different ends of the heat exchanger. So the notation is really kind of clumsy, and you just have to for every problem, like draw out what the setup is and really set up your notation and then stick with it throughout. Okay. So inner and outer diameters, inner and outer fluids, no thickness of the wall. And then finally, um, for this case also, The H coefficient on the inside of the tube, the convection coefficient, is H1 or HI. And then for the outer side of the tube, H2 or HO. So with the setup we have here, the um, total resistance, the total thermal resistance expression is typically written like this. So now we have the diameters given. So the um, area expression is just pi dl, and it's the inner diameter um, times the uh, inner convection coefficient, hi, plus 1 over pi d l h o. And note that this is again the inner diameter because the relevant surface area that we're talking about, so we're talking about convection on the outer part of this inner tube, so the relevant surface area is again just the same surface area of this <coughs> inner tube. And because the um, thickness is negligible, the surface area of the inner and outer parts of the tube are the same. So that's why you have pi d i l on both the inner and outer convection. Is that track? Okay. So you really have to be kind of uh, thoughtful about what your what part of the problem you're looking at and how your notation is laid out. Okay. So we'll jump into some more analysis and start kind of, yeah. Um, with all these assumptions, how much air is it to use to do 20% off? Yeah, I mean, that's a really hard like, like ballpark. ballpark to give. I mean, you're going to be using, um, typically you're also going to be using empirical correlations to calculate the H of the inner and outer surfaces. So, I mean, just the empirical correlations alone can have up to like 20% error. So that on top of, um, typically you're also going to assume, we'll talk about in a second, you're also going to assume that it's like insulated on the outer surface. And that is, I mean, can be close to or far away from a perfect assumption, just totally depending on what the heat exchanger setup is. Um, and that's actually something that you'll look at in lab. Um, so the only analysis we're doing is assuming that it, it's perfectly insulated. 
but you can see the insulation on the heat exchanger downstairs is a little iffy. Um, so, I mean, there's that, there's the, the empirical correlation. Um, the assuming negligible thickness, if it's a really thin copper, can be a pretty good assumption. Um, so, I mean... For like a good heat exchanger design, you have a ballpark for that? Uh, no. <laughs> I, <laughs> if I did, it would just be, I would just be making it up. No. And that's not something the book gives either. I like how far off the estimate's going to be. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> but you can figure out for the lab, kind of get an idea for the error for that. Yeah. Okay. All right, so let's go into some more heat exchanger analysis. So typically, when you're looking at heat exchangers, you want to calculate Q, as always, the heat transfer rate between the hot and cold fluids. So we will Consider a concentric tube heat exchanger and let's list all of our assumptions. So we're going to say it's perfectly insulated from its surroundings. No significant kinetic energy or potential energy changes. So basically that's saying that there's no significant changes in the flow rate or the flow speed. And there's no kind of significant changes in the height of the water. There's no phase changes, so the fluids aren't undergoing any sort of evaporation or condensation. And then we're going to assume constant specific heats. And as before, just calculate the specific heat at kind of a average temperature over the entire, um, uh, the entire flow. So the kind of average mean temperature, again, is what we're going to use, just like for internal flow for calculating the CP. We're going to be operating at steady state. One dimensional heat transfer in the radial direction, which is Um, kind of the standard assumption that we make for um, heat transfer through composite cylinder. So basically there's no, we're saying there's no heat transfer in the um, axial direction by conduction. No energy generation. And then isotropic properties. That is an eight. So quite a few assumptions. Some of them are much better than others. Uh, for example, perfectly insulated from its surroundings, probably a questionable assumption. No phase changes, you can verify whether or not that's occurring. Steady state, usually a good assumption. No energy generation, usually a good assumption. Um, 
But some of these others, like no significant kinetic or potential energy changes, if you have a constant flow rate, then that's a good assumption for kinetic energy. For potential energy, um, actually the heat exchanger downstairs does <coughs> do like this with its loop. So there's a little bit of a potential energy change, but you can basically calculate it and figure out whether or not it's significant um, compared to the magnitude of um, kind of the rest of the um, uh, the rest of the energy exchange that's going on. Okay, so for all of those assumptions, we're gonna have we'll just draw heat exchangers all day. Insulated, center tube, So we're setting up the um, kind of derivation with the hot fluid on the outer um, part of the heat exchanger and the cold fluid on the inner part. So then we'll have Q moving from the hot fluid to the cold fluid. And because of the assumptions that we set up, just like with our composite cylinder case, yeah? I was just wondering if there's any advantage to having like the hot fluid in the outer cylinder or the inner cylinder. Um, good right? question. So actually for the lab, um, I think I'm remembering this, remembering this correctly. For the lab, you have the cold fluid in the outer cylinder and that's so you have a smaller temperature difference between the outer fluid and the surroundings because it's not perfectly insulated. So that kind of lowers <laughs> your temperature difference from the get go. And therefore you, yeah, because the cold fluid tends to be, it's like sitting in the building, right? So um, it tends to be closer to the ambient temperature than the hot fluid, which is being heated. Um, an interesting part of the experiment actually is uh, if you run it, depending on when you do the lab, if it's been running for a while, you might be getting colder water than some a group who came before you because you're actually starting to draw. I don't really know how long it takes, but if you like basically draw the water out of the whole building and then you're like starting to draw water from the ground or like somewhere colder outside, um, the temperature will drop compared to what it was initially. Okay. Yeah, so but like with sorry, the go assumptions, ahead. then there's no advantage. Like if all the assumptions are true, then it doesn't really matter the configuration. It's just like for real world situations right that, yeah know. yeah yeah I think so I can't really think of any situation where in this like perfectly simplified heat exchanger it would be better to have the fluids swapped I mean the uh, again for the perfectly simplified situation if the tube wall is basically negligible thickness then you're still gonna have the same surface area on either side right. yeah I guess the only thing could be if um, you somehow had the having it in the outer um, heat exchanger enabled you to have kind of like a larger effective diameter and then have a turbulent flow, whereas the inner flow was would be more likely to be laminar. That could be a consideration. Yeah. Okay. So because of the assumptions that we set up. Um, Q out of the hot fluid. Is equal to Q through the wall. And 
Q into the cold fluid. So again, that's kind of like the basic assumptions for the um, composite cylinder saying that uh, enables us to say that the heat transfer rate through all three of the materials or all three sections is uh, equal to each other. And then just like with internal flow, we'll have kind of two different ways of calculating Q. So as for internal flow, there are two methods for calculating Q. So the first one is the steady flow thermal energy equation. So a lot of this analysis is going to look um, very reminiscent of internal flow because you basically just have two internal flows right next to each other. And I want to kind of very explicitly d draw the distinction between these two, uh, the two ways that we're going to talk about calculating Q. And so for this equation, if you remember, um, it's M dot CP times the uh, outlet temperature minus the inlet temperature. So this looks at delta T between the inlet and the outlet of a single fluid. Whereas um, calculating Q more from like the convection rate equation, uh, kind of HA delta T, so for internal flow, that's surface temperature minus mean temperature. That's looking at the delta T between two different things. So either the outer fluid or in the inner fluid or the surface and the inner fluid. Whereas this equation is looking at one fluid and the temperature difference between the inlet and the outlet for that one fluid. So for the hot fluid, Q is, and we use hot and cold subscripts, so H and C subscripts, M dot H, CPH. And then for the hot fluid, um, kind of the way it's uh, typically given is we are calculating the magnitude of Q with this equation, and then we know the direction of heat transfer because we know that heat transfer is going to be going from hot to cold. So that's why you have the inlet minus the outlet in this case because you know the hot fluid is going to be losing heat, so the temperature is going to be dropping, and the inlet minus the outlet is going to give you a positive quantity, so that gives you positive heat transfer. For the cold fluid, it's the same thing, except you have the outlet minus the inlet. So this gives the magnitude of Q and the direction is known as hot to cold. And then we can also use our expression for heat transfer through a composite material. 
So the second equally valid way of calculating Q. And instead of looking at the temperature difference between the inlet and outlet of one fluid, either the hot fluid or the cold fluid, this is going to look at the overall temperature difference between the hot and cold fluids. So this looks at delta T between the hot and cold fluids. So just like with internal flow, heat transfer is going to be occurring as you kind of move along in the x direction. So the delta T between the hot and cold fluids is going to be changing as you move along in the x direction. So you could get um, an expression for the instantaneous Q at kind of any given X location and look at the specific temperatures of the hot and cold fluids at that X location. But the way we're going to do the analysis is get this kind of average rate of Q. Um, so look at uh, kind of the bulk uh, mean temperature difference and then use that to get this average Q over the entire length that we're interested in. So if you remember our expression <coughs> for heat transfer through composite materials, it's this overall temperature difference. So in this case, it would be the temperature difference between the hot and cold fluids. So you may have a uh, temperature of one of the fluids and then the maybe the wall surface kind of has a different temperature and then that temperature changes through the wall and then the cold fluid is a different temperature. Um, but for the composite material equation, we just need to look at the overall two temperatures um, for kind of the start and end points that we're considering. And the assumptions that we made initially, again, are enabling us to use this analysis. So the steady state, 1D heat transfer, no energy generation, isotropic, that's what's allowing us to use the uh, composite uh, total resistance concept. So the, the fluid temperatures vary with X. just like with internal flow. So for heat exchangers, we're going to again use this log mean expression, this delta T LM. Write that a little more clearly. Log mean expression for the delta T. And you can actually go through and show why the log mean expression is the correct um, kind of mean, uh, mean temperature expression to use in this case by applying a first law energy balance between the two hot and cold fluids. And you'll also see this written sometimes using this U notation. So that's something that we introduced when we were talking about heat transfer through composite materials, um, but wasn't super emphasized. So that is the overall heat transfer coefficient. And so you can see this U times A is equal to 1 over R total. So for a situation, if you have negligible wall thickness, the area will be the same for the inner and outer, um, the convection on the inner and outer surface of the tube. So if you were, for example, given this overall heat transfer coefficient, you could calculate Q just from that. But if you cannot neglect it, you need to calculate the R total using each different convection and conduction expression because the surface area will not be the same between the inner and outer parts of the tube. Okay, questions?
All right, so the log mean temperature difference, similar to internal flow, but we need to have a specific definition for heat exchangers. And this is where that um, the use of one and two for two different ends of the heat exchanger is going to come into play. And we'll draw out diagrams for the parallel flow and counter flow um, setup so you can see what one and two corresponds to. So delta T2 minus delta T1 over the natural log of delta T2 over delta T1. And because of the properties of natural logs, if you pull out a negative, the um, numerator and denominator here are swapped. And then that negative can go up to the top, multiply through. So you end up with this just being equal to delta T one minus two over the natural log of one divided by two. So same expression. And so here, the subscripts 1 and 2 designate opposite ends of the heat exchanger. And although, the, although this notation is a little bit clumsy, it's necessary because for parallel flow, the inlets are both on one side and the outlets are both on one side. So you can just have inlet and outlet side. But for counter flow, you have the inlet of the hot on one side and the inlet of the cold on the other side. So one end of the heat exchanger is the inlet of one fluid and the outlet of the other fluid. And the, the same is true for the other end. So you kind of have to have a way of talking about it where you can just say, Okay, this end of the heat exchanger versus this end of the heat exchanger is designated as one and two. And so because of that, the exact definition of the log mean temperature difference depends on if you're talking about a counterflow or parallel flow configuration. So exactly how delta T1 and delta T2 are defined depends on the heat exchanger configuration. So let's talk first about parallel flow configuration. So we defined these two different configurations previously when we were introducing heat transfer or heat exchangers. But as a refresher, the hot and cold fluids enter at the same end. So they enter at the same end, they flow the same direction, and then they exit at the same end. And because of this, the biggest temperature difference between the two fluids is going to occur right at the inlet. So you have the hottest hot water and the coldest cold water coming in, or fluid, and then heat transfer is occurring as you move through the heat exchanger. And so the hot water is getting colder and the cold water is getting hotter and they're getting closer and closer to the um, temperature of the other fluid. So the biggest delta T between fluids 
occurs at the inlet. And decays with X. And because of that, the outlet temperature of the cold fluid is never going to exceed the outlet temperature of the hot fluid. So basically they're coming closer and closer to the same temperature as each other asymptotically. The delta T is asymptotically approaching zero. And if you had an infinitely long heat exchanger, you could get those two temperatures to be equal, but the um, the temperature of the cold fluid would never be higher than the temperature of the hot fluid. So the outlet temperature of the cold fluid is always less than the outlet temp of the hot fluid. So we can show what this looks like schematically, and then this will help us designate what the um, kind of what one and two mean as far as the ends of the heat exchanger. So we're going to draw temperature as a function of x. So we're moving along our heat exchanger in this direction. This is one. So one end of the heat exchanger, and then the other end of the heat exchanger. For the cold fluid, we will start at a pretty low temperature, and then it will kind of asymptotically increase. For the hot fluid, we'll start at a higher temperature, and then that will kind of approach the cold temperature. And these two will never perfectly meet unless you have an infinitely long heat exchanger. So here, this is the cold inlet, the hot inlet. The cold outlet and hot outlet. So those subscripts are C and H and I and O. And this one is hot outlet, H O. So for the parallel flow heat exchanger, this is delta T1, so the temperature difference at um, the one, so the first location. So here it's the hot inlet minus the cold inlet. And that is delta T2, so the hot outlet, outlet minus the cold outlet. And then delta T is changing as you move in the x direction. And so importantly, we should note the flow of both of the fluids is moving in this direction from one to two. And this is just the temperature of the hot fluid is a function of x and the temperature of, cold, of the cold fluid is a function of x. So one and two designate opposite ends. So for parallel flow, delta T1 which is defined as the um, temperature of the hot fluid at station 1 minus the temperature of the cold fluid at station 1. For this, that's the hot inlet minus the cold inlet. Delta T2 is the hot temperature at station 2 minus the cold temperature at station 2. 
and that is the hot outlet minus the cold outlet for a parallel flow. So HI minus CI and HO minus CO. Okay, let's dive into the counterflow configuration. Did you all have any questions on this before we move on? Okay, counterflow configuration. I find this one a little harder to wrap my head around. The parallel flow is kind of very intuitive. So for the counterflow, hot and cold fluids enter at opposite ends. They flow in opposite directions and they leave at opposite ends of the heat exchanger. So you have the hot fluid that's going from hot to colder, cold fluid going from cold to warmer. So the hottest part of the hot fluid at the inlet of the hot fluid is transferring heat to the hottest part of the cold fluid, right? So this is the inlet of the hot fluid. It's as hot as it can get. This is the cold fluid. It's coming in over here, heating up. And then once it's at the same exposition as the inlet of the hot fluid, it's as hot as it gets. So hottest part of the hot fluid, transferring heat to the hottest part of the cold fluid. And the same is true for the other end. So you have the coldest part of the hot fluid, transferring heat to the coldest part of the cold fluid. Okay. So I think I'll just go straight into drawing the diagram for this one, instead of trying to write that all out. So we still have one and two designations. But now we have the hot fluid entering at one and it's decreasing in temperature until we get to two here. And then the cold fluid entering at a cold temperature and then it's kind of gaining heat. And there's not um, a whole lot to be said for the exact slopes of these lines. We'll talk um, probably on Monday about the heat capacity rate and how that can kind of change what these slopes look like. So the um, properties of the different fluids, but you can see that this is definitely distinct from the parallel flow um, situation where you had kind of the biggest temperature difference at the inlet. So now here we have the hot fluid moving in one direction and the cold fluid moving in the other direction. So this is the hot inlet in the hot outlet. But now we have the cold inlet corresponding to station two and the cold outlet corresponding to station one. And this is defined as delta T1, just like before, and delta T2. Yeah. Um, are those supposed to be treated linearly, or is that what you meant by? Delta not necessarily delta linear. Delta. Yeah. No, not linear. Okay. Yeah. Ever? Um, not ever. It could be linear. Okay. <laughs> um, but yeah, so they could be any shape, basically. Um, yeah, so I'll say slopes are qualitative. Not necessarily linear. Not necessarily linear. <laughs> 
So delta T1, delta T, delta T2. This is our hot fluid and our cold fluid as functions of x. Okay, we'll start back with that on Monday. Have a good weekend.